Hey guys, Andre from High Performance Academy here again and this is another one of our webinars. We're going to be diving in today on barometric air pressure correction basically. What we need to do in order to get good stable control over both fuel and ignition as our altitude changes. Uh, for some people that's not going to be a big consideration particularly if you aren't seeing large changes in altitude with the cars that you're tuning then some of this becomes a little bit less important but uh, of course for those who are seeing significant variations in altitude then uh, you do need to keep this in mind if you want to get nice control over everything with your tuning. So we're going to look at the options and basically how we deal with that as we get through today's webinar. Before we do that though with our pre-shows, a few things I wanted to cover off here uh, that have been happening over the last week or so and I want to actually start by introducing uh, one of the projects we will be working on this year which is our Toyota FJ 40 project. Uh, so we'll jump over to my laptop screen and this is actually our second FJ40. I don't know we've got a fetish for them or something. We bought one uh, probably about a year ago pretty good condition and these are getting really hard to find in good condition. Uh, anyone who knows older Toyotas will know that they have a great tendency to rust really thoroughly so finding one that isn't full of rust or hasn't been repaired horribly is tricky. So we found one that was in pretty good condition and had a frame off restoration uh, on the chassis. Uh, the bodywork though as a lot of people have done uh, it's really hard to find the factory panels now. Again most of them are rusted out and uh, the owner of the vehicle had decided to refit Fit a lot of the, the rusted out panels with fiberglass. Uh, nothing specifically wrong with that but we're pretty fussy here at HPA and we wanted something that was as uh, sort of genuine as we could. So this one came up not long after we bought the first one and the price was right. Uh, the bodywork on it is really really tidy and all of the factory steel panels are there. So I purchased this. This one is running the 3B series uh, diesel engine, the other one we've got is the uh, 2F uh, inline 6 petrol engine. So that doesn't really matter because as uh, we go through uh, what we've got planned you'll see why. So at the moment uh, it's pretty much as we picked it up the only change we've made is that it's now got a set of 1552 uh, wheels on it and some off-road mud tyres. Uh, so the interior again pretty tidy and one of the things we're going to be doing with this is trying to get a nice balance between the original condition uh, and the original look, the antique kind of look of these old FJ40s. Uh, this particular model is a 1984 uh, and we want to modernise it though. So a lot of the interior in particular there we're going to be keeping pretty much as it is, just a restoration of some of the, the components such as the, the gauge cluster which you can see in there. It's actually not in bad condition but a little bit tight. This has had a uh, revinyled uh, bench seat in there, probably going to be uh, making a few changes there as well. But basically, the interior will be as it is. Uh, where we're going to be seeing some big changes, first of all, will be in the engine department. Uh, and this is where it gets a little bit tricky. The FJ40 followers are pretty passionate people, so it's really hard to do something to one of these trucks without uh, irritating some part of the FJ40 fanatics group out there. And we knew from day one that while the, we've got a lot of respect for some of these trucks that are rebuilt to 100% stock condition and some of the prices you see them go for are in concourse condition absolutely insane but what we want is a practical car this is actually my daily driver so I want to be able to rely on it I want a little bit of power doesn't need much it's not a race car uh, but I want uh, sort of modern performance that we expect from our current crop of uh, EFI. Case in point here in Queenstown we're just getting into the beginning of winter and we're seeing temperatures hovering around the sort of minus two to positive two degrees C vicinity in the mornings and uh, at the moment with the old 3B diesel engine it doesn't really quite like getting started up in the morning so that's one problem we want to address. So we are however wanting to keep everything in the Toyota family so I see a lot of these vehicles that are swapped in with LS uh, V8s or even the older 350 Chev etc uh, and while that's definitely a solution, probably a pretty cost effective solution as well. I didn't really like the idea of a mismatch between the engine and the chassis so we want to keep it in the family and uh, that's why we're going to be swapping in a 3UZFE. 
or maybe a 1UZFE. We haven't actually got a donor engine. We'll see. This is the donor engine that we're using to rebuild our uh, race car. So if you've been following for a while, you already know a little bit about this. So the idea here is, again, doesn't need a lot of power. Uh, depending on which generation of this particular engine, whether it's 1U or 3U, you're sort of somewhere around about the 300 horsepower vicinity, give or take. So uh, it's not really the power that is the key part here that we're chasing. Uh, what I want is something that's nice and tractable with a really really wide uh, torque curve, that, that's going to be pretty important to me. Uh, and these also sound pretty good and a pretty cost effective engine. So that's going to be what we're focusing on there with the engine swap. Also going to be modernizing some of the other components on the truck. So no power steer is not ideal. Uh, we've got drum brakes all around. Again, not really ideal, particularly once we do start adding a little bit more power to it. We'll address that in a second. Uh, the other aspect with the, uh, the stock setup is that it runs a four speed gearbox so quite wide ratios it's a bit like rowing a boat when you're changing gear not really particularly precise and uh, also you sort of got the thing screaming at uh, road going speeds out on the open road albeit that uh, in stock form going much over about 80 kilometers an hour yeah it's sort of taking your life in your hands a little bit as well so again we're going to be sorting that out what i like to say about the stock truck as it sits at the moment is uh, that every trip it's an adventure, and that's part of the the uh, sort of appeal to uh, of these trucks, at least to me. And I might be in the minority here. I think across the world we see a lot of them being built and modified, so I, there is a pretty strong following. But I do accept that this is a bit of a uh, move away from our normal programmed material here at HPA, a little less performance orientated. So uh, we'll just jump across to my laptop screen again for a second. And uh, this is kind of where I got the the sort of bug in, in me about uh, building a, an FJ40 as a bit of a daily driver. Uh, Icon is an American brand, uh, also comes from uh, the Land Cruiser company or TLC, which is uh, their other sister company. Uh, basically, they've been restoring uh, Land Cruisers under the TLC brand back to basically uh, show, showroom condition for years. And uh, again, it's getting harder and harder to find the factory parts in good condition. Also, there's that sort of fine line between rebuilding the factory showroom spec or something that's actually a bit more modernized and a bit nicer to drive these days so that's where the icon brand came about and essentially what you see there is uh, very little FJ40 left in it this particular company is using a custom chassis built by Art Morrison over in the US and basically every single component on the truck is, is completely new it uh, uses a complete aluminium tub as well which gets around the problem with rusting so uh, yeah not a lot of FJ40 there but it's still I think does a pretty good job of embodying the original look and feel of the FJ. So we're trying to go down that path without the sort of 200 odd thousand US dollar price tag that I'm pretty sure an Icon uh, FJ40 comes with. So I've already covered off the, the engine conversion. Uh, those Icons just for interest do use the uh, GM uh, LS V8. So we're, we've got that covered with the uh, 3U ZFE if that's the way we go. Uh, the other aspect though that's a, a real sort of downside to these original FJ40s is the uh, suspension setup. And no big surprises again these were designed I think the earliest ones were maybe in the 60s or early 70s somewhere around that era so uh, they haven't really changed a lot and they are designed to be uh, basically a workhorse and easy to service and repair so not a lot of thought went into the practicalities of getting good road manners and nice smooth drivability comfort etc that really didn't matter when they're designing it uh, so what we can see here is uh, they run uh, a leaf spring arrangement front and rear and as I've already mentioned they are drum brake uh, in particular with the steering box arrangement although it's impossible to really get away from a little bit of play in a steering box uh, where when you've got one that's a little bit worn you sort of got about a quarter of a turn of steering lock from side to side when you're driving at speed which again doesn't really instill a huge amount of confidence so uh, the chassis is really what we want to address so uh, again I've been researching this project for a, a really really long time and sort of building up ideas of what I want to do and how we want this to come out uh, so this is uh, sort of a chassis that's kind of aimed as a bit of inspiration so this is from uh, the Roadster shop they uh, well known US manufacturer of chassis for US muscle cars as well as a lot of trucks and they don't actually do a chassis at the moment for the FJ40 although from my understanding I think they are working on it but uh, this is just to give you a bit of an idea of, of where we want to go uh, 
Uh, this is one that they designed for the Ford Bronco. So basically the idea is this is a complete replacement chassis. It's using all modern technology. It's much stiffer and stronger than the factory chassis. Uh, and of course you can see there, uh, it's got a full coilover conversion front and rear. So we can't buy a chassis like that for the FJ40. It wouldn't make any sense. And here at HPA, we kind of like to make our, our job as difficult as we can. So we're going to be essentially replicating this sort of upgrade to our existing FJ40 chassis. So this will encompass uh, new diffs front and rear that'll be a bit bit stronger than what we've got and a uh, a conversion to four link with the coilover as well so uh, at the same time be adding disc brakes to the setup so really excited to get stuck into that probably over the next few months uh, and because of the current situation with COVID all around the world uh, we usually have a pretty hectic schedule of travel to all sorts of different events so typically uh, we'll end up going to SEMA, PRI, uh, uh, a couple of other events potentially in the US and Australia. Last year we went to Goodwood Festival of Speed over July as well. This year we've pretty much scrapped all of that. It's uh, pretty apparent that travel internationally is going to be difficult if not impossible and I also foresee probably a lot of the events that we would be normally heading to uh, we're not going to be able to go to. They're probably going to be cancelled uh, or some other form of trouble for us to get there. So what we're trying to do is focus on creating some more content in-house. So uh, that FJ40 build will be coming along hopefully in the not too distant future and uh, on that note as well we have started a vlog we had our first episode release last week so we'll jump into that uh, in a second I'll just cover off what's included but uh, we will be covering off a lot of the FJ40 build in our vlog and it's sort of a bit more of an informal behind the scenes look a little bit less polished than our normal production qualities but you get a bit of a raw idea of exactly what's going on. Now as well as the FJ40 build I'll just do a quick update on the FD RX7. Uh, we're expecting the harness to be back with us in the next few days so once that's in we're just about at a position to get it ready to start up. And I have been talking over the last few uh, shows about the drive-by-wire conversion and that's basically finished now. Obviously we can't quite test it yet until we can power up the Adaptronic ECU but uh, this is the 3D printed bell crank that goes onto the factory throttle body. Uh, at the moment it is just 3D printed plastic. Once we've finalised and made sure that the uh, motion ratio is matched between the drive-by-wire motor and the throttle body uh, that will be finalised in uh, steel, something a little bit stronger. But you can see there we've got a threaded rod here with a spherical bearing on the end of it that runs up to that. A uh, little hard to see it all in one place but this is the 3D printed bracket that I've kind of been going on about for the last few weeks. That's mounted to the aircon bracket and then of course the BMW drive-by-wire throttle body motor uh, is mounted there, drive-by-wire motor. So that rod there, that's where it attaches to the drive-by-wire motor and of course the other end just what I showed you there. So that's all come out pretty good, we're pretty happy with how that's all looking and uh, there's only a really small list of final jobs to, to get done there so can't wait to get it up and running. Uh, one of the jobs we have been doing, or well Brandon's been doing, I can't really take any credit of, for this, is the uh, battery uh, mounting as well as wiring up the main power feeds to the starter motor and uh, earths etc. So uh, some of this can be a little bit tricky, finding a neat way to run your battery cables through the car, particularly we've taken the, there's not a lot of room in the FD RX7 engine bay, we've taken the opportunity to actually mount a smaller battery inside of the cabin. Uh, so this means that we then need to get the battery cable through the firewall. There's a variety of ways of doing this but uh, I've never really been overly fond of any of them. Of course if you've got a, a suitable budget you can use a, uh, an Autosport connector but uh, that starts to get pretty pricey particularly by the time you've got the crimp tooling uh, required for large gauge contacts. So uh, what we've done is we've gone with the Amphenol uh, Radlock system which is what we can see here. I've got uh, two feeds coming through the 
bulkhead there and that's just where the factory air conditioning used to be we've removed the aircon out of the the car uh, so these are really nice because they're so quick and easy to install and remove so you get a stud uh, which we can see here uh, and that just clicks into place so uh, I've got one here uh, so this is the stud and it's also going to go straight into our battery so we'll have a quick look at that uh, under our overhead camera it might be a little bit hard to see because it's quite shiny but there is just simply a little recess groove at the top of that and this is the other part here uh, so this is a simple crimp that you can crimp onto your battery cable and then it's just simply a case of sliding that into place, it clicks into place, it still rotates as well which is quite nice, uh, you've got a nice positive electrical connection and then to remove it, no tools required, there's just this little tab that you press down and you can remove that. So uh, I haven't seen a huge number of people using these just yet, we actually spotted them at PRI last year and uh, there's a, a couple of companies seem to adopt them at PRI. Uh, we see the new Haltech Nexus R5 is using them because that's a power distribution module as well as an ECU and uh, the other place I saw them was at the ECU Master Stand on their new Autosport uh, PMU or Power Management Unit. So quite a cost effective option and just needens up uh, the solution of getting your power feeds on and off in particular uh, I'm sure a lot of of people have probably been in the situation where they've been using a ring spanner to undo a positive terminal and uh, accidentally ended up shorting that out. Pretty ugly situation. Don't really want yourself in that situation and that will avoid all of that. So uh, there you go. That's just a little product that I thought I would showcase here. Um, right, I just want to quickly jump across to our Instagram for a moment and uh, this is an Instagram I actually put up a little while ago and I repeated it uh, because it did get such a good response uh, and this is a shot that we took over at Goodwood Festival of, of Speed last year and this is uh, unfortunately an era that's gone by, this is the old F1 naturally aspirated era where we saw V12s, V10s and then finally V8s being used and uh, of course those were that was the era of uh, RPM limits that were sort of 18 to 20,000 RPM and then above. And uh, these engines, I think if my memory serves me correctly, and uh, there'll probably be some F1 fans out there who will pull me up if I am wrong, I think in the final era uh, the engines were around about 2.4 litres in the V8 form before they went to the uh, turbo V6. Uh, despite the relatively small displacement, these engines were making, depending on who you want to listen to, 700 plus horsepower. Uh, the highest numbers we sort of heard for the larger displacement engines in the three, three and a half litre uh, era were in the region of eight to nine hundred horsepower. Now traditionally that would seem like an impossible number to get to uh, if you didn't have a su supercharger or turbocharger helping you along. And I just really wanted to quickly mention the the way that the power and torque work, which I know a lot of people kind of don't get the relationship between power and torque. So torque uh, is, we can think of this as airflow essentially into the engine. So uh, the more airflow we can get into the engine, the more torque. Now that's a very simplified view, so I'll explain why I'm mentioning this. Uh, uh, so when we're talking about power, uh, if we're using uh, pound foot of torque and horsepower then the relationship there is we take our torque value multiply that by the engine RPM that the torque value is measured at and then divide it by a constant which is 5252. So this is why if you're looking at a power and torque graph in horsepower and pound foot uh, those two lines will always cross at 5252 because at that point the multiplier of RPM cancels out by that uh, constant that it's being divided by. Anyway what this means is that RPM is quite a powerful multiplier in that equation. So we don't actually need the engine to produce a huge amount of torque if we can take advantage of the RPM multiplication factor. What I mean by this is we can make a relatively small amount of torque at exceptionally high RPM, 18 to 20,000, and you've got the value of that RPM multiplier, 18,000, 20,000. Multiply that by the torque divided by 5,252, and this gives us our horsepower. So that's all pretty easy math, not a lot of uh, trickery in that. The, the key point here is for these engines to do what they do, 
every single aspect of the engine has to be optimized uh, around making the torque at high RPM. And what this requires is to optimize the airflow in and out of the engine at very high RPM. Uh, there's a lot of tricks going to uh, engines at this level in terms of uh, scavenging effect, getting the exhaust gas out of the cylinders, and also a ram air effect with the tuning of the inlet tract uh, to actually uh, force more air in and basically achieve a volumetric efficiency above 100%. So uh, that was just a shot of the fairly exquisite uh, exhaust manifold on that particular engine which again obviously in terms of optimizing the airflow in and out of the engine uh, that's a, a really important aspect of it. Now, if you aren't following us on our Instagram already please make sure you do so we're HPA 101 uh, we post pretty much every day and we always try and post up some interesting content that will get people thinking and hopefully talking. Uh, also just quickly we'll pop over to uh, the YouTube channel here and uh, again this is what I mentioned this is our first episode of our vlog uh, where we go a bit deeper into our FD RX7 project. Again for those who have been watching this pre-show for a while you've probably already got a bit of an idea. Uh, the, the problem with this FD RX7 is it's already basically two thirds built so uh, this vlog aims to catch you up on what's been going on and uh, all of the products that have gone into it so again slightly more informal sort of look at what goes on at HPA uh, and we're going to be bringing out these pretty regularly if you are on our YouTube channel make sure you su subscribe if you like that video give it a thumbs up if you've got any questions please ask in the comments and we'll do our best to get through and answer all of those and lastly for today we are running another one of our giveaways so this is for a FuelTech FT550 ECU plus our suite of online tuning courses. There are 10 days left to get yourself into the draw. Hopefully Scott can drop a link into the comments that you can follow to get your name into that draw. So the FT550 uh, is an ECU that we're quite excited to actually test out here. Haven't had the opportunity as yet. We've had one sitting on the shelf for a little while uh, and one of the key key features that really separates this ECU from uh, others on the market is the fact that it sort of doubles up as an ECU a dash logger and a dash display and it's also touch screen as well so quite unique. Uh, you wouldn't be sort of aiming to make all of your tuning changes from that touch screen but it is quite helpful if you want to make small adjustments on the fly maybe in the pits without needing to get your laptop out. The suite of tuning courses will of course let you know how to actually go about tuning that as well so you'll be knowing what to do. Uh, so yeah, 10 days left, jump in the drawer and uh, you never know, you might be the lucky winner. We'll ship that anywhere in the world. All right team, thanks for watching there. Give us a few moments and we'll get started with today's webinar. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.